So most people are in the uh, webinar right now. Um, so we, we, we can start now. Good day, everybody. Thank you all very much for joining today and welcome to this technical webinar in which we will explain how the hybrid PLC and the REF solution uh, works. Uh, in 2020, the G3 PLC Alliance decided to develop the first open standard for hybrid PLC and RF communication. And now, one year later, uh, we have published the, uh, the hybrid specification and we launched the uh, certification program just earlier this month. And we will have the first certified hybrid devices very, very soon. So we are very pleased that we can now welcome you to this session explaining how the hybrid technology actually works. Um, my name is Leon Vergeer and I'm the General Secretary for the G3 PLC Alliance. And in the webinar today, we have um, real experts available for you to explain how the technology works and to answer all the questions uh, you may have. Um, I will briefly introduce the people and then we'll go to the actual presentations. Um, Cédric Lavenu, he is, the, he is from EDF R&D and is heading the technical working group in the G3PLC Alliance. Matteo Faresio from ST Microelectronics in Italy will make a presentation. David Sancho from Microchip is joining us today, as well as Kevin Jones from Renaissance and Vincent Marie from Trialog in Paris uh, will be in the presentations today. And all these people actually actively participated in developing the uh, specification. So they, so they really should be able to answer any of your questions um, in this session today. Um, so what agenda did we prepare? Um, Cédric Lavenu will, will start by introducing the hybrid solution and explaining a little bit about the next steps in the development. Then Matteo will explain about network discovery and bootstrap. Um, David and Vincent will tell you all about building routes over the hybrid profile. And then Kevin will talk about introducing hybrid nodes into existing uh, PLC uh, networks. Then after that, um, we should have time to answer um, any questions to make any further discussion. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please uh, post them in the, in the questions box in the control panel, and then we can either address them right after the presentation or at the end of the webinar in the, in the discussion. Um, after the webinar, we will share the presentation with all of you, as well as the recording of the, uh, of the session. Um, so I think that's it for, for the introduction. Um, and not to lose any further time, Cedric, I, um, I hand over to you for the first topic, if it's okay with you. Yep, thank you, thank you. Hello everyone. Welcome also to the um, to this webinar uh, on my behalf. So thanks for joining. I'll try to introduce the hybrid PLC and RF solution, uh, trying to understand uh, why we made this development, and progressively we will go to the details of the solution. So what it consists of. Um, so next slide, Leon, please. Um, so basically. Uh, on the right side, you see a typical hybrid network where you have one PAN coordinator, so PAN C, the, the, uh, the ping device, which is uh, managing a hybrid network consisting of the black nodes, the black hybrid devices. And you can see either communication is done uh, using power line communication, so JTPLC, so the green links, or uh, you may use radio frequency uh, media between each of these nodes. Of course, uh, these media can change over time and 
nodes can 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 of course dynamically adjust the medium they use to uh, reach uh, the destination. So basically, when we uh, use both GDPLC and RF media, we really manage to uh, maximize coverage and resilience of uh, the resulting uh, thanks to the resulting mesh topology. All right. Next slide, please, Leon. You will you will also uh, because of that. Uh, provide a really efficient solution uh, for many use cases at a smart grid, smart city, and it really enhances the relevance of the GDPLC technology. Next slide. You and and you and the goal also of doing this is because uh, while enhancing uh, the actual use cases where GDPLC is already used for. Uh, we, we really think that the hybrid will extend uh, GDPLC capabilities much beyond smart metering. So I already pointed uh, to smart grid and smart city, but you can also imagine lighting control, building automation, demand response, and already existing railway application also having GDPLC. So here, the hybrid really helps to do that. And in the next slide, we show that this is not different from what is already uh, what, what GDPLC already aims at as it's a multi-purpose technology and with a hybrid profile we can even further leverage uh, its uh, its capacity to, to address multiple and many application use cases. Um, on the next slide please Leon. So here uh, the first question to, to that we ask ourselves when we started development it's, it's which radio frequency technology to choose you probably know the picture on, on, on this slide here where each uh, RF, or it's not an, uh, it's not a, a, an uh, exhaustive of course, but you have a lot of different uh, well-known RF technologies that are classified, uh, taking into account uh, the range and data rates that is obtained. Uh, and uh, one and the criteria to, to choose which standards uh, to implement um, it's basically about having an open standard. We, we would like to avoid vendor lock-in and uh, we, we want to reach interoperability. So that's uh, first very important criteria also um, echoing the uh, spirit of the GTPLC Alliance. Uh, we need, of course, a compatible data rate. Uh, you would have some technologies that would be uh, too low with respect to GTPLC, others that would be much more much too high data rates, so that's also one important thing to take into account. We need a technology that could be uh, deployed in a private owned network. Uh, we cannot rely on cellular technologies, for example, that rely on the telecommunication operator infrastructure, uh, at least um, I mean, at least as the way they're deployed uh, mainly. Um, in terms of range, kilometer range would be uh, the preferred option as well. Uh, we will have star and mesh topologies uh, up to uh, a few kilometers probably. And then uh, we had to choose between lower layers and communication profiles. And as we will show in the next slides, of course, um, it's important that uh, you get uh, this connection to maybe just a fire and Mac of, of the technology. And that's why we made the choice of uh, of IEEE 802.15.4, which by the way is already the baseline for GTPLC, so it's an easy, it's an easy choice, an easy match to the actual protocol stack. Um, and uh, we decided to use the uh, FSK, FSK Phi, the Smart Utility Network FSK Phi that is defined since IEEE 802.15.4G amendment also used by some alliances for some specific technologies. But here we, we make use of the RGPLE standard and we adapt it to our hybrid profile. Next slide, please, Leon. So the, the result is this protocol stack you can see on screen. Um, as a reminder, GTPLC really defines everything between phi and uh, above uh, just uh, above six low pan, IPv6 is out of scope of the GTPLC alliance uh, uh, definition. Uh, so here we basically add parallel phi, so the Sun FSK phi, uh, a parallel RF Mac, and we have a hybrid abstraction layer you can see in blue here. 
which basically uh, allows um, to, to switch between the two uh, lower layers for PLC and for RF and you make these choices uh, as, a, as, as we will also present it afterwards but uh, it, everything is done uh, to make this as transparent as possible to the six low pan which in which we keep the existing low genie routing protocol we keep the low pan bootstrap protocol that is um, responsible for managing the devices making them join the network and, and, and maintaining it over time so um, that's really done in a very very transparent way for, from a GTBLC stack point of view it's even very transparent to the application layer of it because all of this is totally uh, is totally um, uh, the application layer is totally agnostic about which media is used, so it's very easy. It's very easy to to use this hybrid uh, GTPLC um, uh, profile uh, the same way you would use a GTPLC only, for example. And and what is nice with that is you get full backwards compatibility with any GTPLC network. So you might you may uh, put one or several nodes in an existing GDPLC network to do some, some, some extensions with RF, whatever use case um, could be, and this we will address it also later today. And uh, you, you could, of course, have your 100% uh, hybrid network also with that. Uh, so we, uh, we consider that here PLC is still the primary medium and RF is considered the secondary medium. So uh, on the next slide, I will try to to enter a little bit uh, more the the different uh, the different layers um, of the protocol stack, starting with Fi and Mac. For the RF part, for GPLC, it's already um, quite well known. So as I said, as I said, FSK Fi is uh, defined according to 2015 and 2017 Amendment V uh, specification uh, of Article 8.15.4. So this is just for the normative references. We in the first um, in the first step we support the 863 870 megahertz band. That's what it is about when we certify devices in the program that has been launched recently. We use unslotted CSMACA for non-beacon enabled networks, so something very similar to what we use for the PLC part already. Radio frequency information is also shared between neighbors using information elements. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we, we chose to, to keep 802.15.4.2015 Mac to, to uh, use this information element feature to share information between neighbors, same way as GTPLC uses, for example, ToolMap, ToolMap response, negotiate the modulation and the channel you use for communication. We do something similar with the information elements where we can exchange duty cycle information, link quality information, so that all devices maintain this RF information in dedicated um, uh, the, the date table, which we, which we call an RF post table. Uh, according to IEEE uh, terminology. So when we go uh, to the upper layer, uh, so in the next slide, um, so we'll talk about this hybrid abstraction layer and, and actually this, uh, this abstraction layer doesn't do much basically. It basically defines the media types. So uh, as you can see on, on the table on the right side, you either choose to use PLC with RF as a backup, you can choose RF with PLC as a backup. You could use both PLC and RF interfaces. This is quite useful when you are having broadcast traffic or for beacons you don't know, um, uh, beacon uh, quests you don't know over which medium you, 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 may, you may receive uh, a response. So that's what you would use. But you could also use PLC ORF, so meet types three and four, without any backup interface. So that's what 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 the hybrid abstraction layer defines. And then it's on the set of primitives that just makes the link between the uh, Mac, uh, the Mac service primitives, and the six loop pan, uh, and the six loop pan layer. So that we have YAL, that's the way we call them, hybrid abstraction layer. Uh, data request confirm indication for, for data traffic and we have also a set of primitives um, to ensure more specific pan information to be propagated to the high layers such as typically the scan uh, the YAL scan uh, primitives which which uh, allows to discover uh, the environment and to join the network as I said 
that shows it and deals with uh, the uh, second transmission attempt using a backup media if this is uh, actually selected in the media type, so for media type zero and one, where RF or PLC could be used as a backup if the primary in phase of PLC or RF does not work for the, the appropriate transmission. On the next slide, um, th that's almost the, the end of the presentation uh, for my part. Uh, I just wanted to, to shed some light on the way uh, the, the adaptation layer is shared between the two media. As I said, there's almost no change. The only thing that changes is to add a media type uh, field uh, in both routing table and uh, blacklist neighbor table entries, where we can specify. So for the route table, that's quite straightforward. We specify uh, explicitly over which media uh, we should forward a packet um, uh, when we trying to reach a destination. So which is the media to the next stop to the destination, PLC or RF, and you would use the media types defined in the slide before. And in the blacklist neighbor table, you could eventually blacklist uh, RF or PLC interface for a specific neighbor in case of delivery failure. And if you have that, you would typically a forced forwarding of the backup medium for the next transmission attempt, so you, you avoid losing time in, in, in retries. And finally, uh, last slide as far as I'm concerned. So next, next slide, Leon, please. Yeah, so the what, what I want to, to finish with is to say that basically RF and PLC link selection is done during the load NG uh, route construction process. Uh, load NG is actually making the choice uh, and, and, and routes are constructed exactly the same way they are in JTPLC only. Uh, you would just update uh, the, uh, the metric with two more weighing factors, which are duty cycle consumption and of course the RF link uh, quality. Uh, so you would adapt this link metric for an RF link uh, and this would be considered uh, for RF link, for PLC links, you would mix the different metrics and you would still choose the best route according to the to the final route bus you have uh, towards the destination as we already do with, with Node NG uh, in JTPLC only. So uh, to really, the, 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 you have the route table penalty to avoid fitting too much your routing tables, you have the hop count penalty uh, to avoid having too many hops to the destination, so that's already existing also in, in PLC. And then we have uh, the, the, the link cost penalty. So we also have link cost penalty in JTPLC. Yeah, we just use uh, link cost derived from the RF, SNR, and LQI. And finally, we have a duty cycle penalty because there's a lot of regulation where you cannot uh, transmit continuously. So you make sure that uh, you avoid uh, you avoid using too much too much too much the same neighbor when when forwarding messages. Um, so that's that's basically the update you make to the uh, to the uh, link cost. So thanks, thanks for for listening. Uh, I will then hand over uh, just maybe to Leon and, and then to, to, to my yeah. colleagues. Yeah. Before before Matteo takes over, one one short question we received. Um, um, Cedric is, can you can you briefly tell a little bit about the standardization of the of the hybrid solution and the yeah. uh, the LMS Cosm profile? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's okay. So two two things to 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 be aware of. Uh, so GTPLC um, now teams with ITU uh, since a few years uh, and, and updates ITU TG9903, which is the uh, reference ITU T standard for GTPLC. So uh, right now we are actually in a in a in a we started a revision cycle, so an amendment embedding. Uh, the hybrid profile as an annex is on the way, so we hope that uh, uh, that the ITU process will be completed soon. Um, uh, I would say that we expect this by end of quarter two, but you never know in standardization processes things can take longer. So that but that's the goal. As far as DMS Cosm is concerned, um, there's also something we have uh, high, uh, we have um, clearly uh, tagged as an important thing to do this year. Is to actually uh, put all the um, the RF uh, specific um, 
um, attributes, let's say, to configure the stack to, to put them into DLMS COSIM into fast classes in addition to the existing TFPLC ones. So this is also something we expect to do this year. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. Then. Thanks to um, all. Matteo, we'd like to hand to you. Oh, yeah. I forgot just one thing about the. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. There was the slide about the, the, the next step. Just to say that uh, before I hand over to Matteo, uh, that we're working on the introduction of new operating frequencies and of frequency hopping to tackle a lot of different uh, regulations and regions worldwide. And we, of course, consider uh, the support of battery powered device in the future. So sorry for, for this, but this is an important addition you need to consider. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Then, Matteo, now we really over to you. Okay. Thank you, Leon. Thank you, Sadiq. Um, I'm going to, to talk a little bit about the network discovery and, uh, and the bootstrap. So, uh, let's start with the network discovery. Uh, that means uh, when the G3 devices are powered on, so the first thing they have to, to do is indeed to um, uh, search for other networks and for other devices to join uh, to join the network. So there, there are two steps: first the network discovery, and then the the, the booster. The booster is uh, in a, it happens in a second step, and it is the process to get uh, the addresses and the, the the keys used for encryption to to uh, to uh, join uh, to really join a network. So regarding a disc the discovery. Uh, it is handled uh, by exchanging beacon requests and beacon uh, messages. In the example uh, we are showing in this slide, there is device X uh, that is uh, discovering, uh, that is trying to discover, uh, to discover the, the, um, uh, the devices that are already in the, in the network. And we can see that is uh, transmitting uh, the beacon request uh, message on both uh, interfaces. So it will send, uh, device X uh, will send uh, beacon request over PLC and, and over uh, RF uh, medium. So there are some, in, in this network, in this example, we have uh, some uh, G3 PLC uh, uh, only devices uh, as A and C. Indeed, as Cedric said before, um, the hybrid uh, G3 hybrid specification is compatible with G3 PLC only devices. So those devices, A and C, receives, uh, receive the, the beacon request messages uh, on PLC only, obviously. In this example, we have a device uh, that is device D uh, on the bottom uh, that is connected only through RF. We can suppose that uh, the PLC link is really weak. So device D uh, receives uh, the beacon request only on the RF uh, medium. And we have uh, device B uh, that is receiving the beacon request coming from X on, on the two interfaces. Okay, what's next? Um, the devices, um, uh, you can switch to the next slide, John, please. Okay, okay, great. So the devices, uh, receiving the beacon request uh, will reply to that with the beacon message. So the, the idea in the, in the hybrid specification is that uh, um, the beacon is sent on the, on the media on which the beacon request is received. So uh, A and C will reply uh, sending the beacon on PLC only. Device D, uh, which did not receive the, the beacon request from X on, on, the, on the PLC, will reply only in, in RF. And the device B will reply with the beacon using both uh, uh, media. So now X, uh, to complete the discovery process, will collect all the information. Uh, we can jump to the next slide, John. Okay. So at the end of the discovery process, um, the, the hybrid abstraction layer uh, scan confirm 
will send to the to the higher layers um, all the band descriptors collected both from a mac uh, the, from plc mac and rf mac the band descriptor is uh, the information gathered from uh, each beacon uh, each beacon message received from uh, x the, the important thing to underline here is that, uh, okay, so some of them are obvious. So the, um, the beacon received from PLC, so A and, and, and C, um, in this case, only uh, one beacon is received, so it will generate only one PAN descriptor. So we will have, X we will have the information received from A and from C uh, about uh, the link quality to A and C uh, measured on PSC, and also the information contained and carried by the beacon, so the root cost from A and C to the PAN coordinator. Um, but in case um, the, the beacon is received twice, one from uh, the PSC medium and one from RF medium, the, the hybrid abstraction layer generates uh, two different PAN descriptors. Uh, one, of course, some information uh, is, is, is shared. For example, the root cost to the, from B to the coordinator will be the same for uh, both PAN descriptors, but LQI uh, will be different. There will be, uh, in one case, it is computed over the PSC link, and in the other case, it is computed uh, on, uh, on the RF, uh, RF link. Um, so now the, the device X will have to, to choose the agent to start the bootstrap uh, with. And it will do that based on the information um, um, that, that you get from the, the panel descriptors, that, that is the, the, the link quality of the various beacons and the root cost to the coordinator. In this example, for example, we see, uh, you can go to the next slide, please, Leon, that device X is choosing um, as a agent uh, the device B. And uh, um, it chooses to, uh, to start the bootstrap with the RF uh, medium. So we can suppose that in this case, uh, the device B has a lower root cost coordinator uh, compared to the other devices and that uh, the link quality uh, measured on the RF uh, medium, it was uh, uh, higher compared to the PLC link. Now the bootstrap phase is starting, so X will uh, send joining uh, messages to the PAN coordinator relayed by, by B. On the other side, the PAN coordinator is replying with bootstrap messages, the challenge messages in this case, to the device X uh, relayed by, by B. Now we are encountering uh, an issue um, that was not present in the, in the PLC. Indeed, the device X at this point in time uh, does not own a 16-bit addresses. It's using a 64-bit address to transmit to a device B. So it cannot be put inside B's routing table and uh, when device B has to relay to device X the bootstrap messages, it does not know, is not aware of uh, which media type has to, to use uh, to transmit to X. So B get a message from the bank coordinator and says, okay, now which, which, uh, on which medium do I have to transmit, PSC or RF? Uh, you can go to the, to the next slide, Leon, please. And um, okay, indeed, uh, when we developed this, the, the hybrid specification, um, we modified the, the bootstrap protocol, adding a bit, uh, so a new, a new bit, uh, exploiting uh, some uh, reserved fields, uh, just to say uh, which kind of um, uh, medium the LBA, so the agent, has to, uh, to, uh, to use to transmit to, the, to, to X in this case. So when X is sending the bootstrap messages, it will 
set this bit accordingly to the media use. The PAN coordinator receives the, mess the, the boost of message from the agent, and when it builds uh, the response, it will copy this uh, bit, it will use the same values. In, uh, in, in this way, the agent, uh, it, it gets the message from the PAN coordinator, it look to the to the to this bit and is aware of the media type to be used transmitting to uh, to X. So if X transmitted using RF, the agent getting the message back from the PAN coordinator knows that it has to transmit uh, to X using the RF medium. Otherwise, it knows that it has to transmit to, uh, to the PSC. Anyway, another important thing to to say about that is that. Um, this is an optimization we added in the hybrid specification, but as Sedek said before, everything is compatible with uh, G3PLC only devices. So if we, if we attach a hybrid device in, uh, to the network, it will join anyway um, to the PAN coordinator, to the, the existing network. If this uh, feature, if this bit is not uh, uh, employed, the agent will um, um, Will detect it because uh, it, the field will be uh, not used and so it will try to, to reach the bootstrapping devices using PLC first and then if the transmission fails it will use uh, the RF as a second attempt. Okay go ahead please. Um, yeah. Okay, last slide from my side. Uh, this is to highlight um, the modification on the bootstrap uh, commands um, on the ADP layer. Uh, indeed, Sedic before said that uh, um, the, the hybrid, adding the hybrid abstraction layer is really transparent to the, to the user. This is 100% uh, true for uh, the data transmission and the receiving uh, primitives. Uh, to handle the bootstrap, um, some uh, the, uh, the parameter media type, so the media type parameter has to be added, uh, for example, in uh, uh, network join and this, uh, in the network join primitive when uh, the application join um, call this primitive to join the network. The media type is also added in the PAN descriptor uh, um, that is uh, uh, collected during the, DPD, the DPM discovery confirm. And also on PAN coordinator side, um, when dealing with uh, bootstrap messages, the media type parameter has to, uh, to be added. Mm, so it is quite straightforward. Okay, thank you, Leon. It's done. Yeah, thank you, Matteo. Well, you're not done yet. Um, there was one question I hope you can answer. Um, yeah. What is the limit of number of discovering nodes for a bootstrapping device? Um, I think the I think the question is uh, um, how many devices um, can get uh, inside uh, a discovery. So how many PAN descriptor a device can, um, can can receive during the discovery phase? Well, there is no um, there is no limit inside the G3 uh, PLC and also uh, hybrid specification. There is no limit. It's um, uh, it is more a limit uh, um, got from the implementation. So it is an implementation uh, choice, uh, probably limited by uh, the, the, the memory consumption. Uh, but theoretically, there is no limit about the, 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 the PAN descriptor, so the devices that um, a node can hear when discovering a network. Okay, I, I, I hope that answers, otherwise we can discuss at the end, uh, maybe. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, then, then I'd like to move to the... Um, um, Vincent, I think that's you to move to the um, route building in the hybrid technology. Yes. Um, we have to look a little bit at the time, um, so please okay, uh, start. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start. So. Uh, next slide, please. So first, I will go rapidly on how uh, 
route I build on PLC profile. So what is done, for example, in this in this case was uh, the sender A that try to find the route to Z. Uh, and so what he's doing is sending a broadcast route request messages uh, on the network with the destination to Z. And as you can see, the, the, the message propagates on the network with uh, a quality depending on the distance. And each node that receives the route request will compute the route cost based on the formula and populate the routing set uh, with the route, the route back to A with the cost computed. So you can see that the cost uh, augment uh, with distance. So higher root cost is low, is worse. Next slide, please. Uh, next, yeah, okay. And uh, and then each node will repropagate the root request, uh, adding Z root cost to the messages. Uh, so it's cumulative root cost. And if a node receives several root, uh, root requests, which will be the case in, in practice, it will only propagate again if it receives a better uh, root cost value. If not, it will discard uh, the message. So here you can see some of the raw propagation. And for example, you have the node K that received from F that will create entries in the, in the table saying, okay, to go back to F, it costs that much. To go back to A, it costs the cumulative amount and so on. And this will propagate on the whole network. Next slide, please. And at the end, uh, when Z will receive root request, uh, it will receive a, a few, uh, a lot of root requests from various paths, and we choose the best one uh, toward A, and send a root reply in unicast uh, towards, uh, the, towards the root it choose as the best one, and this will propagate the, root, the, the routing tables with the uh, forward pass. And so at the end, you have complete routing tables uh, allowing to go in both direction. Next slide, please. So what changed in the hybrid profile? Not much. The same principle apply. The routing set, the routing table has now a medium uh, information saying which medium uh, is to be used for a given uh, op in the, in the route. Uh, and the broadcast route requests are sent on both PLC and RF, meaning that hybrid device will receive potentially uh, route requests from PLC and from RF, and so uh, evaluate them as two separate route requests, compute the root cost depending on the PLC or RF formula, and choose the best one. So it's the exact same principle. The only thing is you can have route requests coming from PLC or from RF. And this information you put on the on the routing table. For example, here uh, F will prefer RF from A because the root cost is lower. And we have separate root cost formula because we need to take into account uh, specifics for RF or PLC. So what is specific to the quality evaluation of a link, and also. Uh, you control the parameters, meaning that you can choose what you prioritize between RF and PLC. Uh, basically, if you want to prefer PLC, you can just augment uh, how much uh, RF link will cost, and it will not be used if there is a PLC alternative. Next slide. The result uh, route that can be established here uh, it can use PSC or RF for any op of the, in the route. Uh, so this lets you use the optimal medium for each part of the of the of the path in the network, and uh, and the result is you can mix uh, PSC only and hybrid nodes uh, because well uh, the behavior is basically the same and. Uh, if you have PLC only nodes, the only difference is that it will propagate on PLC, and that's uh, the only difference. From the hybrid point of view, it just receives less root request. So, for root establishment, that's all the difference uh, with hybrid. Next slide, I think it's for David. Yeah. 
to the agenda of my intervention. Before we go to David, one, one question maybe, uh, Vincent, you, you, you can answer. Um, it's about the additional route establishment traffic. Um, can that cause issues in the, in the communication in the hybrid solution? Um, normally, no, because uh, the PLC and RF uh, the bandwidths are not shared. So the fact that you have two, two, twice as much message doesn't consume more bandwidth because it's used to the two medium uh, at the same time. And uh, in terms of treatment uh, on the receiver, you are you only consider the one root request at a time. So there is no more memory consumption. So okay. hybrid won't okay. change on the spot. Okay. And is there is there any preference for RF or for PLC routes? In so the, as I, yeah, uh, as I said before, you can configure the routing cost to express a preference for RF or PLC. And the default in the hybrid solution will prefer PLC because we know that better. Uh, but you can change the uh, configuration if you if you need to. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the other questions, I think we can answer later in the uh, in the in the discussion. Okay. Um, then, David, can I ask you to uh, continue, please? Yeah, sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I will talk about the root maintenance on the hybrid profile. Uh, this route maintenance is slightly different than from the previous PLC only implementation to uh, take advantage of uh, having two different media to, to choose. Okay, So it exploits the possibility of using the other medium in case uh, data delivery fails. Um, in case of this other medium is available uh, and delivery succeeds, what will happen is that instead of breaking the, the root on the medium that failed, we will keep using this uh, backup medium temporarily. To achieve this, a blacklist table will be used along uh, with the routing table. This was uh, briefly introduced by Cedric before. And before trying to use the backup medium, um, we will rely on the post table information. We will see these in the following examples to, to be uh, more clearly. Uh, just to say that uh, this temporary invalidation of uh, root uh, is uh, is main advantages to avoid uh, a root repair uh, mechanism uh, flooding. Uh, and given that the backup medium uh, is available, we will uh, avoid this flooding and we will let the channel clear for successive data traffic. So let's move to the next slide to see the examples. Okay, let's see the case that we have uh, two nodes that uh, are uh, capable to communicate in PLC and also RF. Let's suppose that node A has to send data to node B and the routing table states that uh, the data will be delivered through PLC. The data request will be, will, will be done through PLC, but it will be allowed the backup medium usage, okay? So, in the positive case, if uh, delivery through PLC succeeds, uh, the route will be refreshed, meaning that the, its valid time will be reset to the maximum value. Okay, no, no difference uh, here in the positive case, but moving to next slide, we will see what happens if the PLC uh, fails in data delivery. Um, as the backup medium can be used, we will first uh, take a look at the post table in node A, okay? And uh, as the figure shows that RF is in range for node B, let's suppose that 
we have seen some RF message previously from B. Okay, so we will find an entry in 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 the post table. Then we will try to use this uh, backup medium, which will be RF in this example. And uh, assuming this backup medium succeeds, this is um, indicated by the hybrid abstraction layer. So what happens in the loading G is that PLC is blacklisted, but the root is not broken. Okay. So as long as the blacklist uh, entry is present, in case we have to send another data packet from A to B, instead of using PLC as stated by the routing table, uh, as, the, as it is blacklisted, we will use directly the backup medium, okay? Until the blacklist entry uh, expires. So this is the way that uh, this temporarily um, invalidation of the routes is managed using the blacklist table. Next slide, please. And uh, in case that uh, the data delivery also fails in the bucket medium, <clears throat> what happens is that both media are blacklisted, as seen in the in the figure PLC and RF. And here the root is uh, broken, and a new root repair process will be triggered following the process that uh, Van Sand explained earlier. Okay. Let's move to the next slide to see what happens in case, uh, for example, RF is not in range or we are talking uh, against a PLC only node, which for this case is the, is the same behavior. Okay. As in case one, uh, data will be sent through PLC indicating that the backup medium is allowed. And the positive case is just the same. Uh, PLC works and then the root is uh, refreshed. Okay, next slide, please. We will see what happens if PLC fails here. Uh, then in both cases, uh, either because uh, RF is not in range or either because B is a PLC only node, we will not find any uh, entry in our post table for uh, node B in RF, okay? So in this case, the backup medium is not even uh, tried and it is indicated to load in G by the hybrid abstraction layer. So the root is immediately broken. The PLC medium is blacklisted and um, the root repair process will be triggered as in the previous example. Okay, so this is uh, how the roots are maintained, invalidated or broken in the hybrid profile. That's all from my side. Okay, thank you very much, David. If if anybody has a, a question, please uh, post them in the um, in the uh, in the control panel, and then we will answer it online or in the uh, in the discussion um, in a few minutes. Um, but before we go to the questions, we have one topic to cover. Kevin, can I ask you to? Um, Perfect. Explain Thank you. About Thank the you, next Leon. Slide. All right. So next slide, then, please, Leon. There it is. Okay. So um, yeah. Good. Good morning. Good afternoon, um, guys or everybody. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for the presentations earlier. What we've seen then is um, actually how devices can scan on the network in in both mediums on RF and PLC. Um, we've seen how they then bootstrap to the network, how they join and how they form routes. Um, and basically we've seen that that's quite a simple mechanism by just extending uh, in most cases a, a media type field in some of the frame propagations and things like the pan descriptor lists. So actually um, this means we can, we can um, combine the benefits basically of the existing G3 PLC. So just to touch on those slightly, we still use the latest cryptography with the AES128 for securing data. Um, 
both channels, as Cedric mentioned, the RF mechanism, the 802.15.4 RF layer, the Sun FSK, was chosen basically for its similarities uh, to PLC. So by that, we mean it's uh, a very robust RF mechanism and offers a similar data rate on the, um, the, the phi layer and also um, a good range and a good robustness in terms of performance. Um, and that also means we can still use the IPv6 datagram. So we'll talk here a little bit about the introduction of hybrid and use cases. Um, but that means with IPv6, there's billions of addressable spaces. So that opens up the market for Internet of Things. Um, and one other part actually from the G3 PLC Alliance is the certification platform. Um, so all products and platforms undergo very uh, robust certifications. So generally there's an interoperability testing, which is about uh, testing the FI, the MAC, and some other test cases, and there's about 40 of those. With the G3 conformance test, then there's approximately over 130 conformance tests that each product and platform has to go through, um, not to mention then for products, the, um, the performance certifications. So we've seen the backward compatibility, we've seen how the interoperability works, um, just quickly from the Alliance side as well, we've been working over the last uh, six months on the hybrid conformance tests. So actually we're building on the existing PLC certifications and that means for the RF devices, we will have um, approximately an additional 80 tests for the RF conformance part. So they will need to be done by products and platforms. Um, so that builds basically on top of the PLC. So a hybrid device will have to undergo around 200 plus conformance tests. Um, so as you can see, the network operators themselves or uh, utility companies can be assured that actually we're building on a very uh, interoperable, a very compatible and a very well tested um, specification. Um, so basically, depending on the field conditions, we've seen that um, two devices can send uh, information over the best available channel and we maximize the coverage and resilience as um, Cedric mentioned earlier. So what does this mean for a hybrid? Well, hybrid devices can be seamlessly introduced into existing networks. So we will see the next use case, maybe maybe there's intermittent communications or not so reliable communication from a PLC side, then it's possible to just insert and upgrade uh, a couple of meters to hybrid devices. Um, and this allows utilities as well to um, upgrade the infrastructure over time. Um, we've seen that PLC only devices will continue to operate even with hybrid devices in the network. Um, and that means the complete network can be upgraded piece by piece over a long, a long period if, if uh, wanted to. And obviously um, the hybrid nodes can be introduced um, from scratch also. Uh, next slide then please Leon. So we tried to look at a couple of the use cases. Um, for, certainly from the PLC part. So no um, AMI and AMM technology cover, currently offers 100% uh, um, success in um, reading. Um, so if we look at the G3 PLC side, then we'll advertise around over 98% uh, success rate in reading the data. Um, but if we look at the, uh, the, the, the map on the right hand side, um, so what we can see in the green circle is, is a PLC only network and you can see there's a high concentration of PLC only devices and the blue pin indicates the PAN coordinator located at the medium voltage substation, uh, medium voltage, low voltage. Um, and what we can see actually in, is in rural locations, there are, there are a few meter points where maybe connectivity isn't as reliable as uh, in the concentration area. Um, and this means with the introduction of the, the hybrid network, actually we can introduce an, an RF or um, possible backup RF medium in these locations. So as I've mentioned and as Cedric mentioned, the um, RF technology being based on SunFSK, well in the 868 megahertz band range, so that's a European band range, then uh, the range is, is over two kilometers. It can be up to tens of kilometers, um, certainly in outdoor suburban areas with clear line of sights. Um, so hopefully that can then ex improve the limited connectivity in certain um, areas. And the initial trials so far of the G3 hybrid are showing reading rates of 98 to 99.7. So really um, just pushing that extra 2% so we can see it already offers a high reliability. 
Um, from a network operator side of things, those those last five percent of devices, um, or last two percent, if you like, of the the uh, meter points, become very expensive to read. So you know, if you have to send a person physically to those locations, uh, then they're generally more uh, isolated and um, they're not as simple or quick to read as a as a street in a in a city would be. Um, so actually, the the cost of doing that. Um, is, is a way out, for, um, is benefiting basically the utility to pay for the infrastructure of a hybrid network rather than have the um, cost of reading those extra percent. Um, so it also means that um, it could be some considerations when you install a hybrid network from scratch, you might want to concentrate on PLC only in a, um, in a dense area with maybe a rule that if the distance of the meter is a set X, or so let's say one kilometer, two kilometers away from the uh, PAN coordinator, then it becomes a hybrid node um, by default. Um, so the, the, the flexibility, it's, it's very, very powerful. Um, and one other point maybe to mention there is, is actually with the introduction of hybrid networks, then we can maybe remove these less reliable links or remove links where the modulation is generally robo mode. So robo mode is, is a lesser performance uh, modulation from the PLC side. So if we can remove as many robo links as, as uh, possible, then we can improve the performance of the existing networks. So next slide then please. Um, so this is just another use case where um, actually again in rural areas, um, you may well have two uh, remote villages which are located relatively close together. So using the same um, format, the green circles indicate some PLC nodes and the blue pins indicate the PAN coordinator devices. Um, you can't quite make out the, the distance here, but this distance is um, 200 meters. So you can see these two PAN coordinators are approximately 600 meters in, in physical distance. Um, so what will that, that'll allow us to do is actually combine the two PLC networks um, by just bridging a single RF link. So the PAN coordinators are generally much more expensive than, than, the net, um, than meters. They're typically a factor of 10 or 100 times uh, the cost. So that means we can bring down the overall cost of a G3 PLC network in, in more rural or um, less densely populated areas. And not to mention again here, we can see there's um, meters connected with maybe limited or less performing PLC links um, as isolated properties. Um, so next slide then please. Um. Yep, perfect. Um, so this is the last slide from me. Um, basically, what we can see is that by uh, combining the best of the sub gigahertz RF and the existing narrowband PLC, we can introduce the G3 technology to many other application areas as well. Um, it provides a much more efficient solution for the smart grid and smart city use cases, um, having obviously the, the benefit of a, a dual uh, band. So if we talk about the smart home, then this introduces uh, devices such as in-home devices, which are predominantly RF, heating control systems within the home, which are generally based on RF as well, um, and also opens up the markets for keypads for prepayment meters and smart appliances, so white goods, which are predominantly connected over the, over the mains network. Um, so as you can see, it, it's very flexible and should open up um, a lot of other use cases. If we talk about smart grids and smart cities, so a smart grid is seen as the uh, digitalization, if you like, or the autonomous control of the grid with the introduction of more um, uh, smaller energy generating like photovoltaic cells. And with the PLC then, or with the G3 network, we can actually um, you know, do fault detection and hopefully with the autonomous side of things, we can control switches to actually minimize outages and reroute electrical supply. Um, for smart cities as well, this means environmental monitors, so pollution control, uh, light monitoring, uh, waste management within cities, and lots of other application areas which would benefit from uh, a dual um, RF plus PLC technique, such as EV charging, street lighting, et cetera. And where regulation allows actually then an extension to water and gas meter reading for RF only devices. 
So as we can see, then the hybrid solution maximizes the connectivity coverage um, and provides a much more efficient and cost-effective solution for smart grids, cities, and in the industrial applications. So that's it from me. Thank you, Leon. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin, for this uh, interesting uh, presentation and, and, and use cases. Um, as is always the risk with, with technical presentations, especially that, you, that it takes a little bit more time than we, uh, we planned. So we are at the, at the end of the webinar, but I, I would like to take a little bit more time to answer a few of the questions we, uh, we, we, we still have open. Um, but of course, if people have to leave, we, we understand and you can read the answers in the, uh, um, I will include the answers when I send the presentation to all the, uh, all the participants. Um, so one of the questions um, we, I, I still would like to address, um, maybe um, Cedric, you can, you can answer this one, um, it's about security is the rf communication secured as well as in the plc communication yeah uh, thank you leon so so yes it, it is uh we, we basically uh rely on the same authentication uh procedure as as, as for gdplc using the uh, bootstrap protocol and then of course we have also ciphering at mac layer so it's a really comparable Okay, thank you. Um, another question, um, um, Kevin, maybe you can um, answer that. It's about uh, standardization regulation. What, what is the standard used for RF and MAX power transmitter? Um, and is it RF mesh? I think it's a quite a specific question, Kevin. Okay, so, so the, the RF mesh is probably the easy side of things. So um, as we've seen in the um, load NG, then the load NG establishes the, the mesh routing, which in the hybrid can either be a PLC or an RF link. Um, regarding the standardization, um, I mean, that's, that's a very good question. I think it's quite a difficult one. So if any of the other guys want to jump in at the end, then that's appreciated. Um, but yes, I mean, currently the, the hybrid is, is focused on the, the 8.6, um, eight megahertz band range. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't open it up to other frequencies. So all the other frequencies, certainly the 800 megahertz, which is used in the US and other regions um, is allowed. Um, but yes, in terms of then, if we look at the European regulation, then um, I think around 863 to 870 has uh, limitations or um, set requirements on power levels and duty cycles and also in the 8, 870 to 874 megahertz bandwidth and there's there's different set of requirements for power levels and um, duty cycles. Um, it slightly gets more complicated as well if you delve down into into the layers as well because then um, different countries may well have specific different regulations for each of those bands. Um, from a specification point of view, we can actually cover all of them, which is very, very nice. Um, but to answer the question specifically, um, we would also need to know, uh, you know, what the, what the application area is, uh, because the requirements in Europe are dependent on the application. Um, but also then um, the the country that's of interest as well. If it's in Europe, it's relatively easy. If it's outside Europe, then then obviously we'd need to delve into um, the regulations for that country. So maybe Leon, if, if whoever's asked the question wants to target exactly which country they're coming from and which use case, whether it's metering or um, other, then maybe we can take it offline and, and answer in more detail afterwards. Yeah, sure. If, if, if you have any specific further questions uh, or related to this question, please, um, we will show all the email addresses again later. So please let us know and we will we will come back to it um, afterwards um, we're also answering a couple of questions on the uh, on the on the, uh, on, the on the webinar system as you as you can see um, but another interesting question I think um, Vincent maybe um, you can help me with that one is um, 
in, in case of dense urban areas, um, with hybrid communication, uh, coordinators may receive a lot and a lot, uh, thousands maybe of, of notes uh, over RF. Um, could that cause any, any problems, is the question. Okay, so as we saw before, uh, the bootstrap phase is first discoveries and uh, bootstrap itself. So on the discovery phase, the beacon request and beacon uh, are very small message and there's uh, a random delay uh, mechanisms that avoid uh, the fan connector needing to reply to every beacon request. So that won't create uh, more uh, work on the fan connector side. And then how much uh, device a fan connector is going to see uh, will depend on how many fan connector you have deployed. Because basically, each device will scan, detect all the networks that is near near him, and then decide which one you want to, to join. So if, for example, you put uh, one pan connector for, I don't know, every 500 meters, uh, then normally you should not one you should not have more than 500 meters trying to, to connect to a given pan connector, because they will try to connect to the nearest one. So how many nodes a pan connector will have to, to, to manage will depend on how many pan connector you are deploying, basically. And on terms of protocol itself, uh, the limit is uh, 30,000 nodes per network. Uh, but in practice, the limit will be lower due to basically uh, memory consumption in the pan connector. So, but you could support that. 1,000, 2,000 nodes on the pan connector uh, without issue. You will need to configure correctly the, the bootstrap uh, patent retries in order to not uh, pollute the network too much. But there is already a recommendation how to configure that uh, in the Alliance white paper. Okay, thank you, Vincent. Another question, which is maybe linked to this one, is um, would routing traffic not exhaust communication allowed by duty cycle? Is anybody, does anybody want to answer or add to the uh, reply from Vincent? So would, would routing traffic not exhaust communication allowed by the duty cycle? I mean, maybe I can add then, but I think Vincent um, mentioned it or somebody mentioned it in the presentation that actually the, the duty cycle um, becomes one of the metrics, if you like, for the link cost, um, directional root cost uh, formula. So in the PLC links, we have uh, penalties, if you like, for uh, modulation of choice or whether number of hops away from the PAN coordinator. With the addition of the RF, then we, we've introduced the uh, mechanism where duty cycle consideration is is considered. So when links are formed, then this is automatically taken into account. Okay, okay. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I think we covered most of the, um, the the questions. Or did you see any other ones, Cedric? We need to address. Um, yeah, I think that I'm. Uh, I actually try to to answer most of them. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, you got the answers you wanted. But of course, I mean we stay of course uh, online. Maybe a few more minutes in case there are questions coming in. Yeah, yeah. If you have any further questions, please. Um post them and we will answer them maybe uh, after the call even. Um, there, is, there is further information available uh, about the hybrid solution on our website. Um, the, the, the hybrid specification, uh, Cedric explained, will soon be published by, by ITU. Um, until that time, it's published for the members on the website of the GCPLC Alliance, as you can see in the link here. Um, and we also have developed 
several user guidelines uh, about specific aspects of the G3PLC technology. And one of these user guidelines, which will be published soon, is, is an introduction to the hybrid PLC and RF profile. And that one will be available to uh, anybody. Um, similar to the introduction have we, we, we wrote about uh, G3PLC and important considerations for the certification. And there are several other user guidelines available on the website for members or under development and will be available later this year. Um, so I want to thank all of you for uh, participating uh, in this in this session today, and especially, of course, the uh, the presenters for their their presentations. Um, it's a, it's a really fascinating hybrid technology, I think, combining the best of PLC and and RF. And I hope the session was uh, useful to all of you, and you will develop many products and application based on the G3 PLC hybrid. Uh, technology in uh, in the future. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact uh, me or any of the uh, people presenting today, and we will um, come back to you. There will be a short survey when you leave the webinar um, for suggestions about other topics we could address in future webinars. So please, if you have any suggestions, please let us know. Um, and then, well, again, thank you very much. Have a good day, all of you, and hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you very much.